Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal of the Continuing Church of God. In this sermon I've titled, Halloween Day of the Dead. I want to talk a little bit about Halloween. I want to little talk about all, a little bit about All Saints Day, All Souls Day, and what's called the Day of the Dead. You know, are any of these original Christian practices? Um, where did they come from? Are these holidays things that God approves of? Uh, do Halloween and Christianity, be, uh, do they belong together? Now, as many of you know, Halloween comes from an old English word which means hallowed evening. Now, it's the night before a Roman Catholic holiday uh, that they claim that they got from the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is now called All Saints Day. Now, part of the Roman Catholic rationale for All Saints Day is that they had so many saints they wanted to honor and they decided to lump a whole bunch of them who didn't have a specific day. Now, growing up Roman Catholic, I remember having a calendar for each month. And on each day, usually one to three or four saints, as they called them, were listed. And it was the day for that saint. Well, they ended up with lots and lots and lots of them. So they decided uh, to again have a day where they just lump all, the, all of them to, together. Now, as far as Halloween itself goes, it's pretty well known. It does have pagan origin. I want to read something from the World Book Encyclopedia about, about the day. So the Druids and the Order of Priests in ancient Gaul and Britain believe that on Halloween, ghosts, spirits, fairies, witches, and elves came out to harm people. They thought the cat was sacred and they believed cats had once been a human being, but they were changed into cats as punishment for their evil. Now, in, in America, most modern uh, cat owners would say being a cat was not a punishment. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is what the, what the view was there. It was supposed to be punishment for their evil deeds. Anyway, from these Druid beliefs uh, come this present day use of witches, ghosts, and cats in Halloween festivities. The customs of using leaves, pumpkins, and corn stalks as Halloween decorations also came from the Druids. The early peoples of Europe also had a festival similar to the Druid holiday. So it wasn't just in the British Isles and in Gaul, like France, but other parts of Europe had something sort of like this. Now, getting continuing here in the uh, World Book Encyclopedia. In the 700s, the Roman Catholic Church named November 1st as All Saints Day. The old pagan custom, customs and the Christian feast day were combined into the Halloween festival. And I want to read something uh, else about this. Is the origins of Halloween specifically can be traced back to the ancient Celts who lived what's known as Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and Northern France. And by the way, since I do have a lot of references and um, I looked at the two articles I pulled this sermon from, uh, would take a couple, two or three times as long as I'm going to go through this today. So the articles, one is on Halloween and one is on All Saints Day, All Souls Day, Day of the Dead. Those two articles are available at the cogwriter.com website. That's www.cogwriter.com website. They're free. No cost, no obligation, just read them and, and references, etc. are there. Uh, and again, more information than I will be able to uh, cover in this sermon. Continuing here, the end of October commemorated the festival of the waning year. The Druids believed that during this season spirits walked and evil held power over the souls of men. Certainly an unbiblical concept. On October 31st, their New Year's Eve, great bonfires were kindled, which were thought to stimulate the sun to procure blessing for the entire succeeding year. The fires remained burning as a means to frighten away evil spirits. The Druids held these early Halloween celebrations in honor of Samhain, or Samhain, known as the Lord of the Dead, whose festival fell on November 1st. These 
their, their bonfires or bone fires were also used in animal and human sacrifice, thus the name. That's why they're called bonfires, bone fires. The tradition of lighting a bonfire has continued into modern times. Now notice this said Samhain was the Lord of the Dead. This is a celebration of the Lord of the Dead. And that brought some scriptures to mind. The first is in Mark chapter 12, verse 27. Read something that Jesus said. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. And I would say... Anyone who thinks they should be celebrating the day of the Lord of the dead is greatly mistaken from a biblical perspective. Furthermore, now I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. Now I'm going to read this from the uh, Dewey Rames Bible. There's a Roman Catholic approved translation. It says, For the dead know that they shall die, excuse me, but for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing more. The dead don't know anything, okay? Which is important when you hear about things like the Day of the Dead and All Saints Day and All Souls Day, all of which are in contradiction to Ecclesiastes 9.5 because they all say that the dead are doing something or that the Bible says the dead know nothing more. And that is from a Roman Catholic translation. So Protestant translations say the same thing, by the way, if you're Protestant. Um, and there's uh, one... Church of God translation that I'm aware of, and it also says the same thing. Anyway, now let's go to John chapter 8, starting verse 43. I'd like to take the time and read several statements from Jesus here. Jesus said, John 8, starting verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my words. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And hopefully you're not amongst those who are like that. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, Jesus said, because I'm telling you the truth, you do not believe me. Now, I personally am going to strive, and I always strive to, but... Tell the truth in this sermon. Hopefully you will believe me. Or if you're not sure, check out the references. Look, at, look up the scriptures in your own Bible. See if it says what I say. Even a different translation pretty much will concur with what I'm saying. Almost all the time. Which you convicts me, Jesus says, of sin. And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Jesus had that problem as well. He was Jesus. He who is of God hears God's words. And in these sermons, we try to go over God's words. Right? We quote scriptures, which are God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you're not of God. There's a warning from Jesus that those who won't abide in the truth won't believe the truth because they're not of God. But they say, oh, no, this is a Christian holiday. No, it's not. Halloween is a lie. The dead do not become more accessible then. And, uh, you know, there's, saints aren't answering prayers then. Now, in the Bible, you don't have to go there, but Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, it says, Feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. So we've got one place in the Bible where God says, These are my feasts. And he goes through various ones. Uh, Moses records what God had him say. And it turns out, all Saints Day, uh, or the evening, like Halloween, is not in that list. It even seems to be warned against in other places like uh, Deuteronomy 4. And the Bible actually warns against worshiping the true God with the same types of symbols or whatever that the pagans did. And there's got a lot of scriptures on that, uh, most of which I won't go through today, but some of them I will try to go through. And the Bible repeatedly warns against the practices of witches and dealing with ghosts. Uh, in addition, let's go to the New Testament, uh, Galatians 5. Starting verse 19, the Apostle Paul was inspired to write, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, go down to verse 20, 
idolatry, sorcery, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, verse 21, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who do who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, Halloween is clearly a heresy with elements of revelries that the Bible warns against. Halloween is basically rebellion against God. And it specifically promotes aspects of witchcraft. So let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18. I'm going to start reading verse 10. There shall not be found among you any who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are Christian. No, they are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. God is telling the children of Israel, look, people in the land that you're going into, I'm driving them out because they have all these abominations. Don't do it. Verse 13, You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Now some oppose this, they get stubborn about it, you don't have to go there, but in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So don't cling to some just because it's some tradition. Um, I'm going to read 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. You can go there if you want. Now, even though God told them not to do this in Deuteronomy 18, which we read a moment ago, look what happened. 2 Kings 17, verse 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, practiced witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. So God thought this was a good thing and blessed them for it, right? Because while other people are doing it, we're honoring some kind of God when we do this, so it should be a good thing to do. It's a lot of fun anyway. We all should do it. No. Verse 18. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah at all. So God didn't want this. Now I'm going to read something from the old King James. You don't have to go there, but from Exodus 22, verse 18, it says, You shall not suffer a witch to live. Or in other words, you're not allowed. You're not to allow a witch to live. Now, of course, we don't kill nor advocate killing witches by people now. Uh, capital punishment is supposed to, by the way, be implemented by civil authorities, not by you. So don't think you're some kind of vigilante doing God's will. You're not. God doesn't want you to do that. But consider that Christians should not participate in a holiday that glorifies or otherwise honors witches, either. Okay, we're not. Gonna, we're not going to kill them. Well, we really shouldn't be honoring them or glorifying them either. Now, when I was uh, doing some research on this this year, I ran across an article that came uh, uh, late last year. <laughs> and this is in Christianity Today. It says, Halloween has always been a tricky day for conservative Protestants. Now, by conservative, presumably he means one who might believe that Halloween is a pagan observance and Christians shouldn't be part of it. Now, there was this other headline from Christianity Today a while back that said, Why should the devil get Halloween? Well, the simple answer, it's not a biblical holiday, and the Bible says not to worship the true God like the pagans worship their deities. Now, let's go to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, there are a lot of admonitions in the Old Testament against witchcraft and calling the dead and all this kind of stuff. And the New Testament pretty much says the same things, sometimes in different ways. But there are some warnings. I'll go to 1 Corinthians 10, starting verse 8. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, which, as some of them did, and talk about the children of Israel here, 
And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And as I mentioned before, about the children of Israel being put out of the land because of witchcraft and soothsaying and all this kind of stuff that they weren't supposed to do. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. Okay, so those things were to warn us too. They're not just ancient stuff from the children of Israel back then. Verse 12. You might think, yeah, but I can handle all this. Well, verse 12, Apostle Paul warns, Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed, lest he fall. We are not supposed to follow heathen practices because we think we won't be affected by them. Now let's go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We get some instructions here from Paul of what we can do. Ephesians 6, starting verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Dress up like the devil and then he will flee. That does not say that. So, so we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, being gird, girded your waist with truth. And the truth is, Halloween is not a Christian holiday. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and the Bible teaches all of God's commandments are righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We need to believe what this book says and not follow the world or fall for uh, its ways of how it decides it's better to worship God or to have fun. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us to put on costumes of witches or other things associated with uh, uh, darkness. And early Christians, by the way, did not dress up like witches. True Christians rely on the Word of God. Now, the Catholic Encyclopedia, it admits that Halloween was not part of the original faith. So let me read something regarding this. This is from 1907. In the early days, the Christians were accustomed to solemnize the anniversary of a martyr's death for Christ at the place of martyrdom. In the 4th century, neighboring dioceses began to interchange feasts, to transfer relics, to divide them and to join in the common feast, as is shown by the invitation of Basil of Caesarea, 379, to the bishops in the province of Pontus. Gregory III, 731 to 741, consecrated a chapel in the Basilica of St. Peter to all the saints and fixed the anniversary of 1 November. A Basilica of the Apostles already existed in Rome, and its dedication was annually remembered on uh, 1st of May. Gregory IV, 827 to 844, extended the celebration on November 1st to the entire church. The vigil seems to have been held as early as the feast itself. The octave was added by Sixtus IV of 1471 to 1484. But this is not an original Christian holiday. The Bible says, Contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered the saints. Early Christians did not keep demonic holidays. They kept biblical holy days. Now this particular book, booklet, or any other book or booklet I hold up, is available for free at the ccog.org website. That's ccog.org. You under, under the literature tab toward the top, and then this guy says books and booklets. Click on that. And the covers of the books will show up, and you can click on them, read them. But early Christians kept the biblical holy days, not demonic ones. Now, you may say, well, you're part of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. 
Well, the original Catholic Church didn't observe Halloween either. The Catholic Encyclopedia admits this. More on the beliefs of the original Catholic Church can be found in our free online book, Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church, again available at ccg.org. Now, as far as uh, the Roman Catholics go, um, you get different views. Now, here's something from Isabella Bass of uh, St. Edward's University, which is a Roman Catholic institution. Should Christians celebrate Halloween, or does it conflict with their values? This is from uh, this week it was published. Uh, this date is October 20, 2021. Here. Halloween is a fun day for both children and adults because it's so versatile and conducive to self-expression. Some Christians have an opposition to celebrating Halloween, while others see no problem with the holiday. In my opinion, this woman writes, there's nothing wrong with celebrating Halloween as a Christian. If someone's religious beliefs conflict with the holiday, there are other ways to get into the Halloween spirit. Halloween originated from the Celts' end of summer festival of Samhain. Okay, remember the Lord of the Dead? As the Celts celebrated their new year, November 1st. During Samhain, crops and animals were sacrificed to the Celtic gods as it was seen as a day when the living and the dead came together. According to this tradition, spirits were able to roam free during Samhain, and the Celtics or Celtics uh, hoped to see their loved ones who had passed. This celebration seems like it was rooted in something very positive. But Halloween has evolved into a more negative connotation as time has gone on. The condemnation of Halloween by some Christians is rooted in the belief that Halloween is a pagan holiday. And it glorifies both evil and the devil. Now she quotes religious studies professor Jennifer uh, Veniga who said, As a professor, and in my personal life, I don't see any intrinsic com conflict between Halloween and Christian values. In fact, I think Halloween provides rich opportunities for the faithful celebration of life and a recognition of the realities of death. So the writer continues, I think that's a very interesting way to look at Halloween she hadn't heard of, think, thought of before. She's, she writes also, I agree that Halloween being inherently spiritual as it celebrates life, death, and potential afterlife it would be beneficial, in my opinion, if more people looked at Halloween with this mindset. It would bring more positivity to the holiday. Now notice she's talking about her opinions and her feelings. And, uh, you know, lying about your loved ones doesn't make Halloween good or interesting. Halloween gives a false impression of death. You know, it, it doesn't teach the truth. It doesn't teach the truth about uh, death or God's plan. You know, it's, it's just a lie. Anyway, I want to read from Jesus' words from John chapter 4. John chapter 4, starting verse 23. Jesus said, But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And the truth is that Halloween is a pagan holiday. It's not a biblical one. It's not one that God ordained. And it's not something Christians should do. Now I want to read some justifications from a Protestant pastor by the name of Alan Rudnick. He says, Here are seven ways Christians can take back Halloween. Well, before I read his seven ways, take it back? Huh? It was never Christian in the first place. Samhain. The celebration of the Lord of the Dead. So anyway, here's... He's got his uh, uh, seven uh, reasons. So let's go to the first one. Understand that All Hallows Eve, Halloween, and the ancient pagan festival of Samhain are not the same. Because Gregory the Third and Gregory the Fourth moved it to become a Christian holiday, All Saints Day. When they moved that from May 13th to November 1st to replace the pagan rituals on October 31st and November 1st. Gregory the Third instructed people to dress up as saints. Let the occult have Samhain. We are taking All Hallows Eve back. Well, first of all, notice he's saying 
that he's accepting the authority of a Roman Catholic pontiff, which I thought Protestants didn't do that, although they do have a problem with their history because uh, they didn't break off until the 1500s, and so therefore they must have assumed that the Romans were right before then, you would think. But he's got them dressing up as saints who are dead, but the Roman Catholics teach that you can pray to those people, and they will answer your prayer, and that's not true. And so sometimes they dress up as saints, and sometimes they dress up as gods and goddesses, and then witches and whatever, and that goes on to this day. His second reason, the establishment of Christmas and Easter in Europe had pagan connections, but we don't abandon these holidays, neither should we abandon All Hallows Eve. So what he's saying, because his church and people like him, Protestants, by the way, do not believe in Sola Scriptura, so I'm holding up this free book, also available at CCOG. If you're Protestant, I challenge you to read this book and then try to explain to me why Protestants believe in Sola Scriptura, because those who are keeping Christmas and Easter certainly don't believe in Sola Scriptura, because it doesn't come from the Bible. So what he's saying, this Protestant pastor, is because Easter, uh, from Ishtar, pagan sex goddess, or Eoestre, pagan uh, sex goddess of the uh, sunrise, you know, either way it comes from one or the other, that word, it, they were, those are pagan, so that was okay. And Christmas, by the way, as I think almost everybody knows, was the uh, birthday of, chosen because it's the birthday of the sun god Mithras, November, excuse me, December 25th. So he's saying because Protestants don't believe the scriptures, but go along with tradition, they keep uh, Christmas and Easter, therefore, that's a good reason that you should keep Halloween. So he's saying two wrongs, Make it right, so we make it three. So we're going to be pagan and saying, fine, we'd be fully, more fully pagan. Of course, he didn't word it quite that way, but that's actually what it means. And hopefully you don't fall for that. You know, dressing up the saints and stuff with these saints, Roman Catholics teach that these saints are mediators, but it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, that's not the case. And I'll get to that later. All right. Um, three, from his list of seven. Understanding that early Christians contextualized early pagan holidays into Christian holidays helps us see that we don't have to compromise our beliefs with pagan ones. Anthony McRoy, a fellow of the British Society for Middle East Studies at Wales Evangelical School of Theology, reminds us, of course, even if Christians did engage in contextualization, expressing their messages and worship in the language of forms of local people, that no way implies doctrinal compromise. Oh, yes, it does. What he's saying is two things. Double, just double talk here. First, they really didn't go and take paganism and say it was okay. But since even if they did, it was still okay. Early Christians did not do that. Early Christians didn't do that. I've read, I don't know how many articles in places such as the Catholic Encyclopedia about the origin of various holidays that they keep. And to the credit of the Roman Catholic scholars, they will admit that they weren't keeping uh, Christmas before the 4th century, uh, uh, Easter uh, basically a change uh, from, supposed to be Passover, by the way, which was not on a, sun, uh, on a Sunday originally, uh, etc. They'll admit it, and they'll admit that these things were not part of the original church. When I talk about early Christians, I'm usually looking, talking about people in the 1st century, 2nd century, or 3rd uh, century. Uh, they were keeping these holidays. Any of them. And actually, though, as far as the third century goes, one of the re first people who actually put these things together and said it was okay to compromise with pagans was a guy by the name of uh, uh, Gregory, known as Gregory uh, Thaumaturgus, or Wonder Gregory the Wonder Worker, who was uh, demonically influenced. Uh, as a matter of fact, I actually read something, day before yesterday, it was yesterday, uh, in something called The Hope of Israel, put out by Sabbatarians in the 1800s explaining why that this Gregory was demonically possessed and people shouldn't have listened to him. But he was one who was all in favor of compromising with uh, pagans in order to get them to accept 
his compromised version of uh, what he called Christianity. You know, there's a lot of uh, improper costumes, etc., associated with, with with this holiday, and people still think it's okay. Here's a fourth point. Evil themes in our current secular Halloween observances were not always present. Thus, we can recapture spiritual with the innocent. Halloween does not have to be a holiday filled with Dracula's bloody masks or witches. Well, but that's what people do. Okay? <laughs> that's what they do. Otherwise, the only other thing you're doing, if you do what this Protestant says, is they're observing All Saints Day, which implies that uh, the saints can intervene for you and mediate for you, and that's that correct. Verse, section 5, he says, If you still think Halloween is an evil day, then maybe you should see All Hallows Eve as a time Christians can laugh at and even mock evil. Anderson Rurick assistant professor of English at Mount Vernon Nazarene College in Ohio, challenges us to rethink Halloween. Should the forces of evil be mocked? Should Satan be laughed at? He most certainly should be. At the beginning of the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis includes two telling quotations, the first from Martin Luther. The best way to drive out the devil, if he will not yield to the text of scriptures, is to jeer and flout him, for he cannot bear scorn. That is not the best way to deal with the devil. And you're not supposed to go around mocking the devil that way. The Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee. This is what the New Testament teaches. Draw closer to God and God will draw closer to you. Not, okay, if you can't overcome the devil, you say bad things, devil, bad, bad, devil, you're bad, go away, devil. Now it's okay, you don't want to accept the devil, okay? You, don't, you shouldn't be having a night where you go out to intentionally mock the devil, it's not going to do you any good. And that is not the way to deal with Satan. To deal with Satan is to pray to God for assistance and to draw closer to him. Not to think, oh, the best way is to mock the devil. And again, uh, that particular Protestant was quoting the so-called, uh, I guess the founder of modern, somewhat modern Protestantism, Martin Luther, who I contend did not believe in Sola Scriptura. As a matter of fact, this is supposed to be him on the cover. This is a statue of him. And I'm contrasting that to uh, Church of God leader, uh, considered a saint by the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics and most Protestants by the name of Polycarp of Smyrna. And I've contrasted their teachings in here. One believed the Bible and the other did not. Martin Luther did not believe the Bible and he wouldn't have come up with such absurd things. So the devil right there is just one more example. Number six on this list of seven. Christians should focus and teach the concept of celebrating All Saints Day, November 1st, in their churches. But this is what a Protestant pastor is telling people. Now, and he says the word, uh, the term saint is used uh, 60 times in the New Testament. We Protestants, he says, use the word saint to describe Christians living and dead. We could also honor our loved ones who have given us Christ, such as our parents, grandparents, etc. Sounds a lot like the Day of the Dead. We think, which is mostly a Mexican holiday, we thank God for them and pray that the living saints may live in community. Churches can use All Saints Day to light candles as an act of prayer for thanksgiving, for thanking God for the special people and saints in our lives. No, lighting a candle is not a prayer. Kind of reminds me of what they do in the Buddhist countries. They've got these prayer wheels. You spin them and supposedly all these count as prayers. And some of, the, some of the Buddhists are really, really clever. They've got like little fans on these wheels. So they're always spinning all the time. So they're getting all their prayers in. Of course, this is meaningless as far as God's concerned, pretty much. But the same thing with this whole candle thing. It is a pagan uh, practice and Protestant pastors uh, encouraging uh, uh, paganism. Oops, I dropped this one down. I didn't want to do that yet. Okay. Furthermore, he wrote, we can also learn from the saints of the church the last 200 years. We Protestants have often been fearful of honoring and learning from the church saints for fear that we are venerating them as Catholics do. Well, actually, 
to if you keep All Souls Day or All Saints Day, excuse me, that uh, he's advocating, that's what you're, he's telling you to do is to keep it like the Roman Catholics uh, do it. As far as uh, early church leaders uh, and saints, I held up uh, this book, which I mentioned had Polycarp on it. This one also has Polycarp on it. We in the Continuing Church of God are not afraid to quote early Christian saints. Polycarp, for example, was ordained by the apostles and taught what uh, the apostles taught. Others have said that about Polycarp. There's all kinds of information about him. And there are other early Christian saints that we quote, uh, for example, Melito of Sardis, uh, uh, Theophilus of Antioch, and many others. We in the Continuing Church of God are not Protestant. We're not afraid to quote from early church leaders or church leaders throughout history, uh, some of which I do in uh, actually both of these books. We're not afraid, but we don't hold uh, a day that we go out and uh, uh, pray to them or we don't try to dress up like them or anything like that. We don't consider that they are mediators between us and God. Okay, in the seventh point, this Protestant brought up, he says, Christ holds the keys to death in Hades, Revelation 1.18. We can keep comfort in the fact that Christ defeated death. Even the mere name of Jesus Christ can make evil shudder and even follow the commands of God. At least that's what he says. Well, how can you say that keeping Halloween is consistent with the commands of God? Because it's not. If you believe the Bible, you wouldn't do it. And again, you can't take back Halloween uh, from a Christian perspective because it was never Christian in the first place. Now, let's go to the book of Jude. It's only got one chapter. I read from uh, verses 3 and 4 from Jude. Now, this is a Protestant translation. You would think Protestants would understand this and try to do this. Jude writes, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Notice it was once for all delivered to the saints. It wasn't supposed to change. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Halloween, Easter, Christmas, we're not part of the original faith. All three have uh, aspects that promote lewdness. Uh, lewd costumes are used for Halloween, uh, Christmas mistletoe for physical contact, and sex god promotion or goddess promotion for, for, for Easter. Now, since Halloween is the evening before All Saints Day, um, let me read a couple of things about All Saints Day. The first is going to be from the World Book Encyclopedia from uh, 1966. It says, All Saints Day. It was first celebrated on May 13th, 610. May 13th, 610. Okay, so it wasn't on November 1st. It was called the Feast of All Holy Martyrs, when the Emperor Bocchus gave the ancient pantheon to Pope Benefice IV as a church. Now, the, uh, and the World Book also says the Romans built a pantheon as a temple to honor all their gods. And the name pantheon means of all the gods. Agrippa first built the famous Pantheon in Rome in 27 BC, and my wife and I have visited a few times. Now, I mentioned the Druids before, and I want to read something else about them from the World Book Encyclopedia. Druid priests worshipped some gods similar to those of the Greeks and Romans, but with different names. Of course, some feel that although the Druids worshipped the pagan deities under different names, and that's wrong. They, they accepted the change of names of the gods in the pantheon to, quote, Christ, uh, Catholic saints. It's perfectly acceptable. Just look at my notes here, try to figure out what I'm going to cover or not cover. I think I'll skip this stuff about the pantheon. Um, 
But uh, do I read one thing, I guess, related to the Pantheon. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm going to start reading in verse 2, and this will be from uh, the Dewey Rames the Catholic translation. Deuteronomy 2, verse 2. Destroy all the places in which the nations that you shall possess worship their gods upon the high mountains, the hills, and under every shady tree. Overthrow their altars, break down their statues, and burn their groves of fire, and break their idols into pieces. Destroy their names out of those places. So God told his people, don't keep the old pagan temples and stuff. Oh, these are great buildings. No, just destroy and get rid of them. God said to destroy pagan places of worship, but... He said, don't switch, switch them, but that's actually what happened in Rome. There are several places that my wife and I have been to. We've seen the Pantheon. We've seen uh, certain churches, etc., that were originally uh, for pagan deities, and they just switched them over. Um, let's uh, go also some more uh, in this promotion of this by uh, Christianity Today. Here's something from uh, uh, 2016, October 28th. Many churches put on wonderful events as Halloween alternatives, but I respect that, but I think you should go also go out and trick-or-treat with your neighbors. My point is simple. Don't waste the best opportunity you have to re meet your neighbors. Here's my suggestion. Get a costume. Buy candy. Put a costume on. Give candy out. Go get candy from your neighbors. Meet all your neighbors. Build on your relationships. Here are the four reasons you might want to go trick-or-treating tonight. There's no other night in the year where people you've not met uh, uh, will be coming to your door. So you have an opportunity to meet them. If you don't keep Halloween, you miss this. There's no other night you can go to your neighbor's door and introduce yourself without any awkwardness that you have your kids. Although I would say you can go meet your neighbors <laughs> whenever you think it's possible. It says you don't have to worship the devil to go up to your neighbor and ask for candy. For you can meet more neighbors in one night than any other day of the year. Don't miss your best opportunity to meet your neighbors. Okay. Well, she says this is an uh, evangelistic opportunity. Best time to connect with the unchurched. Don't miss it. But costumes and candy are certainly not part of the good news of the kingdom of God. What they basically do is show that people are trying to blend in, blend in with the world. And we're not supposed to be uh, of the world. We're in it, but we're not supposed to be of it. And this was a problem also in church history. I've looked through records that said uh, with uh, the Saturnalia, which ended up being the time of Christmas, there were concerns in the late 2nd, early 3rd century that professing Christians were more zealous in keeping the pagan holidays than the pagans. And so this is not part of the kingdom of God. It's not something... It's not part of the gospel. This is not the way to do it. There's other ways to meet your neighbors without uh, compromising. And, you know, candy isn't the greatest thing for you anyway. Not that you couldn't ever eat any of it, but... Anyway. Now, are we supposed to just combine all this paganism together and show that we're part of the world so we can meet neighbors? Uh, no. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6. See what the Apostle Paul wrote for Christians. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? But various Protestants said, no, you need to go out in the dark, and you need to do kind of things like the darkness does, so you can get away with this. Paul continues, And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, the living God, as God has said. I will dwell on them, and I will walk among them. I will be their God, they shall be my people. Therefore, compromise with the world to become part of the pagan celebrations. No, it doesn't say that. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We didn't see anything like that when I was reading things from these, these Protestants who were encouraging uh, Halloween, etc. Now, I want to go to the Old Testament. This is to Deuteronomy chapter 12. 
And I'm going to start with verse 29. Now, when Jesus was on the earth uh, before his uh, uh, resurrection, we did not have a written New Testament. But they had the Hebrew Scriptures that we call the Old Testament. So, understand, this is what Jesus would have read, and the apostles would have been taught, and the early Christians would have been taught. The earliest Christians would have been taught. Deuteronomy 12, starting verse 29. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you dwell in their land, take heed you are not ensnared to follow them. After they are destroyed from before you, you don't inquire after your God, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I will do also likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination the Lord which he hates, they've done to their gods. They even burned their sons and daughters to the fire with their gods. Verse 32. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it, that you do not add to it or take away from it. So I mentioned that Deuteronomy 12 warns against biblical, uh, unbiblical practices of worshiping like the pagans did. And if you go to Leviticus 23, God says, these are my feasts, and they're all listed. The biblical holy days are listed. And nothing resembling Halloween, All Saints Day, Day of the Dead, uh, Easter, Christmas are in there. Well, did this stuff go away when the New Testament was written? Well, no. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, starting verse 19. Isn't it okay to, you know, mix, you know, compromise with the pagans, with the, with the pagan practices, as long as we're worshiping the true God? Well, Deuteronomy says don't do that. The Apostle Paul wrote in verse 19, What am I saying? That an idol is anything? Or what's uh, offered to an idol is anything? Rather, the things which the Gentiles, Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. You're not supposed to fellowship with them. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do you, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? You can say, well, it doesn't affect you. Paul says, no, don't compromise. Don't mix them together. You don't have to go there, but in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Paul wrote, Old King James, abstain from all appearances of evil. Yet, the Protestants saying, oh no, you need to go do this, see your neighbors, and act like all the, all the other pagans and uh, unbelievers. That's what she said. Now furthermore, as far as adding to or taking them away, the principle for sure is in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. We're going to start with verse 18. For I testified everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his part of the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The principle of not mixing God's ways with paganism is clearly in the New Testament. You know, we're supposed to believe the word of truth, which the Bible is called in 2 Corinthians 6, 7 and Ephesians 1:13. Uh, now, in the world, it's been said, if you tell a big enough lie often enough, most people believe it. And sadly, uh, those that, uh, most of those in Christianity today, and many Protestants, believe that Halloween celebrations are good. Now, despite the fact that the Church of Rome has often mixed paganism with, with their faith, now, the powerful Catholic archdiocese Mexico City actually condemned Halloween observances as pagan in 2007. Even though a lot of practicing Roman Catholics still keep it there. And here's uh, one of the things uh, the church, their church said. Celebrating Halloween is like inviting Satan into your home. And this was reported by the Associated Press. This, this. So it's Roman Catholic warning against it. And in 2009, by the way, the Vatican itself condemned Halloween. I'll read the headline. Vatican condemns Halloween as anti-Christian. The Vatican has condemned Halloween as anti-Christian, saying it's based on sinister and dangerous 
undercurrent of occultism. The quote, Holy See, end quote, has warned that people should not allow their children to dress up as ghosts and ghouls, calling Halloween a pagan celebration of terror, fear, and death. Well, observing Halloween certainly isn't Christian. Well, what about All Saints Day? Well, on that day, people are encouraged to pray to dead saints to intercede for them. As far as praying to deceased Christians for intercession, the Bible doesn't enjoin that. I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. I'm going to read from uh, the Dewey Rames Bible, Roman Catholic translation. For there is one God and one mediator of God and men, the man Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. So, no, it doesn't say you're supposed to find other mediators to get God's attention. Now I'm going to go to Romans 8, verse 34. Also read this from the Dewey Rames. And one of the reasons I'm reading this from the Dewey Rames is, so if you're Roman Catholic, you'll see that your church's accepted translation of the Bible says you shouldn't do what some of the things your church wants you to do or encourages you to do. Romans 8, 34, Dewey Rames. Who is he that shall condemn? Christ Jesus that died, yea, that is risen also again, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. The only mediator for the Christian religion is Jesus, and the only one to make intercession for us is, is Jesus. Now I want to read something from the New Jerusalem Bible. So I'm going to go to Isaiah 53. I'm going to read a few verses, so you might want to go back there. The New Jerusalem Bible is also a Roman Catholic uh, translation of the Bible. It says, It was Yahweh's good pleasure to crush him with pain if he gives us his life as a sin offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his life. Through him, Yahweh's good pleasure will be done. After the ordeal he has endured, he will see the light and be content. By his knowledge, the upright one, my servant, will justify many by taking the guilt on himself. He's talking about Jesus. Hence, I shall give him a portion with the many, and he will share the booty with the mighty, for having exposed himself to death, and for being counted as one of the rebellious, whereas he was bearing the sins of many, interceding for the rebellious. From the Old Testament of prophesy, Jesus would be the one interceding for us. In the New Testament, said that's what happened. Now let's go to the book of Hebrews. This is in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 7. Starting verse 25. It follows then that his, that's Jesus' power, to save those who come to God through him is absolute. This is also from the New Jerusalem Bible. It says he lives forever to intercede for them. So Jesus is the one who's living to intercede for us. The dead saints aren't. Such is the high priest that met our need, holy and innocent, uncontaminated, set apart from sinners, and raised up from the heavens. He is no need to offer sacrifices every day, as the high priests do, first for their own sins, and then only then for those of the people. This he did once and for all by offering himself. So anyway, it should be clear that it, from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is Jesus who intercedes. Uh, not that uh, dead Christians can intercede on behalf Um, both the uh, uh, Protestant and uh, Roman Catholic translations of Deuteronomy 8, uh, 10 through 12 warn us about uh, being involved in uh, those who consult with the dead. Uh, for example, I'll read uh, from Deuteronomy 18. I'll start with verse 11. This is from the Dewey Rames. Nor charmer, nor anyone who consults methodic spirits or fortune tellers, or that seek truth from the dead. For the Lord abhors all these things, and for these abominations he'll destroy them at his coming. And by the way, the Protestant translations say the same thing. Let me just read uh, from the NIV. Words about witchcraft, those who craft spells, those who consult the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord because of these same detestable practices the Lord your God will drive out the nations before you. So believe the Bible, don't consult with the dead. Now there's another festival 
On November 2nd, often called All Souls Day. And uh, let's see, this is going to be from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The commemoration of the faithful departed is celebrated in the church on November 2nd. The office of the dead must be recited by the clergy if it's on a Sunday. It's based, the basis of this feast is a doctrine that souls which, departing from the body, are not perfectly cleansed from venial sins, or have not fully atoned for past transgressions. They're barred from the beatific vision that the faithful uh, uh, on earth can help them through their prayers. As far as the beatific vision goes, that is not God's plan for human beings. It isn't that humans will not be able to see God once uh, they're resurrected and they accept Him. But the beatific vision is not why God created anything and why God made you. I'm holding up a free book that we have, Why Did God Make Anything? Why Did make God uh, Make You? We talk about the mystery of God's plan. And again, available at ccog.org. In this, uh, he, it says in the 6th century it was customary to start to have uh, ceremonies for praying the dead. In Germany, they had something in 980 about praying to the dead. And this was accepted and sanctified by the church. Uh, and then one of their saints in 1048 ordered this to be done annually in the monasteries. And so this stuff was adopted basically in the 11th century according to a variety of uh, Roman Catholic uh, sources here. I'm not going to read them all. And it says the Greek Orthodox uh, basically do the same thing as well. And they try to claim that they got this from John Chrysostom, which they did not. I want to go through all that. I do have this in papers about uh, purgatory and uh, uh, here. From a Catholic dictionary, let me just read what it says about All Souls Day. All Souls Day, a solemn commemoration of and prayer for the souls in purgatory which the church makes on the 2nd of November. The Mass said on that day is always the Mass for the dead. So anyway, All Souls Day was not part of original Christianity, and it's related to the Roman Catholic practice of uh, purgatory, uh, which is uh, also was not original. Now let me read something from an Anglican priest, Dr. Herbert Leckock, about that. He wrote, Purgatorial Fire. The first real authority for the Roman view is Gregory the Great at the close of the 6th century. So as far as some of what he taught, Catholic Encyclopedia says, Gregory speaks of those after this life will expiate their faults by purgatorial flames and adds that the pain will be more intolerable than anyone can suffer in this life. So their pontiff Gregory the Great said that, yes, if you're not perfect, uh, or by their definition, you will have more pain than you can possibly imagine permanently until it's finally you're, you're purged of your sins. But we do not believe a God of love has a plan that way, but this is what he said. And again, this is from Gregory. He also said, Gregory says, he destroys the salt of the Roman fire who imagines that all who go to purgatory will be saved. So not even all there, he says, will be be saved. And the reality is, this was an idea that they started to come in later centuries. Purgatory was not a belief of the original church. Uh, I won't go uh, into all the details about it, but basically there was a misunderstanding about uh, uh, apocalypsis, or God's plan to offer salvation to all. One of the people who misunderstood it was a guy by the name of Origen of Alexandria. He and some of his views were condemned by the Greco-Romans in the 5th uh, uh, fifth, fifth century and, and, and into the 6th century. And because of that, I believe that that's why purgatory started to pop up, because when they quit looking at what original Christians taught, and not that Origen had it perfectly right, but he had a couple of points that were right, um, the Church of Rome came up with a substitute, which is purgatory, which is not part of God's plan of salvation, which is something, even though Roman Catholics think purgatory is okay, uh, 
It was not an original practice. Protestants say purgatory is not okay, but Protestants also don't understand God's plan of salvation, which is why I'm also holding up a Protestant book at the same time. Again, these are available at ccg.org. And church history, and this is according to a uh, uh, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma book, the reality of purgatory was denied by the Cathari and the, the Waldenses, who, some of which were Church of God people, and so, of course, they would uh, deny it because it wasn't true. It was not part of the faith once for all delivered the saints. And the Waldenses and the Cathari are talked about a little bit in this free book, Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church. Uh, because purgatory is not a biblical reality, it makes sense that those associated with the true Church of God uh, would denounce it. Actually, the Waldensians said that purgatory was a doctrine of Antichrist. Now, the famed Roman Catholic Theologian Thomas Aquinas wrote, quote, Nothing is clearly stated in Scripture about the situation of purgatory. And that's true. Now, I was raised Roman Catholic. I didn't know that it wasn't from the Bible. And then later I found out. You know, what's the Bible say about the state of the dead? Um, I read from Ecclesiastes 9.5 before. It said the, the living are at least aware that they're going to die, but the dead know nothing whatever. And that, by the way, was in the New Jerusalem Bible. The dead don't know anything. So how could it be a purgatory where they're suffering intensely for their sins? And, you know, why should there be holidays indicating you can uh, communicate with them or whatever? As far as death goes, I'm going to read some scriptures. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament, book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 6, verse 5. i read this from uh, New King James. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? Now that's actually Psalm 6, verse 6 in the Dewey Rames, which is, For there is no one in death that is mindful of thee, and who shall confess to thee in Hades? Now I want to go to Psalm 146, verse 3. This will be from the... Uh, New King James. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. Now that happens to be Psalm 145, verses 2 through 4 in the Dewey Rames. So the Dewey Rames says, Put not your trust in princes, in the children of men, in whom there is no salvation. Notice, he said there's no salvation in the children of men. So don't think you can pray to these saints to intercede for you. Anyway, Dewey Rames continues, His spirit shall go forth and shall return to the earth. In that day all their thoughts shall perish. So the Dewey Rames translation of the Bible says when people die all their thoughts perish. They can't help you with salvation. They can't do anything. That is in contradiction to all saints' day and some certain things they have. You know, Jesus taught that death was like sleep. I'm not going to go into that. I've done sermons on it, but for example, you can read about that in John 11, verses 11 through 14. And that Jesus also taught that eternal life would be given at a later time, uh, like in the age to come. And let me just, let's read something about something else here. Luke 18, verse 29. I want to go and uh, read something from the words of Jesus. Luke 18, verse 29. Surely I say to you, there is no one left who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come everlasting life. So there is, a, there is an age to come and there's a resurrection and there will be the first resurrection and then those who uh, were not uh, true Christians will come up uh, in the second resurrection. Uh, this is taught in the Bible. This is the beliefs of the early church. And as far as the resurrection goes, I want to go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, For the dead don't rise, and Christ isn't risen. If Christ isn't risen, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Both Jesus and the Apostle Paul said, Death was like sleep. It's not a time you're getting purged of your sins. Now what about the day of the dead? Now this normally lasts two days. And it's certainly a holiday of pagan origin. I want to read something from the Burke Museum of Natural History. 
The Mexican Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, the festival combines ancient Mesoamerican and Christian beliefs. The Aztecs believed that the souls of the dead traveled to Mictlan, when they found where they found rest. Several Aztec festivals merged with Christian All Saints and All Souls Days to become the Day of the Dead. Now, of course, we don't believe that All Saints Day and All Souls Day are Christian, and I've explained some of the reasons why in this particular sermon. They wrote that uh, El Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, begins on October 31, All Hallows' Eve. Meant to be a time to remember the dead as well as to re honor the continuity of life. Families clean and decorate their relatives' graves and eat picnic meals at the graveyard. They sing songs. And Los Angelitos, little angels, return on this day. No, they don't. On November 1, All Saints Day, adult spirits return, drawn by the altars with offerings that serve as a threshold between this world and the next. It's not true. A chair near the altar allows family members to visit with the dead before they depart on November 2nd when the altar is taken down. The fragile paper decorations, uh, like the transients of flowers, incense, and food, are reminders of the fleeting nature of life. Altars are reminders that the dead are welcomed by the living and continue to have relations with them as a natural part of life itself. And uh, Day of the Dead, you know, celebrated throughout the world. Uh, but mostly uh, in Mexico. Uh, Wikipedia says scholars trace the origin to indigenous observances dating back hundreds of years. The Aztec festival, the goddess Mixtecahuto, uh, and I'm sorry I got that terribly wrong. Holiday spread throughout the world in Brazil. Gia de Finados is a public holiday that they celebrate by going to cemeteries and churches. In Spain, there's festivals and parades. The Day of the Dead is clearly pagan. Now, there was a big movie called Coco that came out, I think, in 20, maybe 2017. It grossed over $800 million. At the time, it was the 16th biggest grossing movie of all time, and it became, by the way, the number one grossing movie of all time in Mexico. I was reading something from a evangelical Protestant minister out of Mexico warning that this has had too much influence and Protestants shouldn't keep uh, Halloween or the Day of the Dead or anything but they keep getting influenced. And uh, let me read something else regarding this. It says, People believe that the gates of heaven are opened at midnight on October 31, and the spirits of all deceased children are allowed to reunite with their families for 24 hours, and then the adults come the next day. I mentioned that already. And it says, uh, uh, Okay, it's got, it's celebrated like a holiday in Mexico, and it, uh, according to legend, spirits of dead meet their living as heaven gates open. But, yeah, the Day of the Dead, All Saints Day and Halloween, they distort God's plan. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I was kind of there before, but I want to go there again. Starting verse 50. Paul writes, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit any corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this, incorrupt, this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. And that happens at the resurrection. It hasn't happened yet except for Jesus. So when this uh, corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass as saying is written, Death is swallowed in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over death comes through Jesus at the first resurrection. The Day of the Dead is a false distortion. Now I want to read Revelation 19, verse 10 from the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a Roman Catholic translation. 
It says, God alone you must worship. And the Protestant translation, the New King James, just says worship God. We are to worship God, not dead people considered to be saints. We're not to venerate them or pray to them. The world claims comfort from doing these things and so I'm observing the day of the dead. Yet it's a distortion of God's plan. Now I want to go to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead will, in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus... We shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The resurrection of Jesus, the return of Jesus, is the comfort we need to know about, not distorted traditions associated with the Day of the Dead. Halloween, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, Day of the Dead, they perpetuate lies. They distort God's plan they make it harder for people to understand the truth. They are not God's festivals. And what gets me is that people don't want to keep God's festivals. God's festivals are fun, nice to keep. Well, David told me we are fasting, perhaps this is fun. But, but, you know, God says, hey, it's a feast to keep my, my days. But people don't want to do that. Instead, they come up with pagan substitutes. You know, I, I read... Leviticus 23, 2 before, it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, these which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts, God says. But the days I've been talking about, don't, they're not part of them. Now I want to read, this will be the last scripture from uh, Deuteronomy 4, starting in verse 15, and this will be from the Dewey Rames. Because we see the Bible specifically warns against creating images which, by the way, are often used in the Day of the Dead, uh, Halloween, uh, sometimes All Saints Day, maybe even All Souls Day. Deuteronomy 4, verse 15. Keep therefore your soul carefully. You shall not make any similitude in the day that the Lord God spoke to you in Oreb in the midst of the fire, lest, perhaps being deceived, you make yourself a graven similitude or image of male or female. Now, I intentionally used the Dewey Rames for this, because it's an official Catholic translation, to point out that Roman Catholics are violating their own Bible when they're involved with images the way they are. Anyway, the Bible repeatedly warns against the practices of witches, dealing with uh, ghosts, uh, consulting with the dead. Those who want to be faithful to the original apostolic faith will not observe All Saints Day, All Souls Day, the Day of the Dead, their Halloween. Believe what the Bible says. And if you need more information about God's holy days, we have a free book available at ccog.org. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.